you would, turn with me in your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, we're going to begin in really the end of verse 5, but verse 6 will work. Verse 5, or excuse me, verse 6, 7, and 8. In your pew Bible, that's page 1,349. 1,349. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 8. And if you would this morning, would you stand with me in the honor of reading of God's Word? Philippians 2, 6 through 8. And the Word of God says this. Christ Jesus, who though He was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made Himself nothing or emptied Himself Taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. You may be seated. You know, last week we looked at Christ's humility and how it calls us, commands us, drives us all to unity, how it ought to, hopefully how it does, that he is our ultimate example so that if any of us gets out of that or out of whack, I'll say, that, that we can all look to Christ and say, do it like He does. He is humble and He has more reason to brag than anyone ever. <laughs> so we can do it like He does, but also the humility of Christ is also not what, it, it is what drives us to unity, but it's also what drives Christ to save sinners. But the humility of God brings up all sorts of questions, doesn't it? Specifically in this passage, this is one of the most difficult, one of the most misunderstood, maybe one of the most contentious passage, passages, speaking historically in the Scriptures. The dual nature of Jesus Christ is a difficult doctrine. It's hard for people to get our minds around. We can accept that Jesus is fully God and fully man, but we don't know what to do with the details. What does that mean exactly? We don't understand it all, and frankly, sometimes we just don't like it. But without the dual nature of Jesus Christ, we are lost in our sins. We need a God-man. We need a Savior who is both fully God and fully man. So this morning, I want you to take a look with me in our text. First, at what Jesus is not. I'm not really counting that as a point, but, but there's some things Jesus isn't. We're going to look at those things. And then we're going to look at the three clear doctrines from our text. You see this coming a mile away. One, Jesus is fully God. He is 100% divine. Two, Jesus is fully human, 100%. And third, Jesus is our humble Savior. Pray with me this morning. Lord God, I, I do ask that you would... Imbue this text with your power and may it go forth and do what you've created it to do in our hearts. And Lord, as always, no matter what is said and done today, may your word speak loudly. Um, if, if nobody hears the rest of the sermon, the word of God has been spoken, it has been read, and may it deepen itself in our hearts and, and, and go deep and, and divide soul and spirit and change us from the inside out. Lord, may we be impressed with this humble God of ours. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So first, let's start here with what Jesus is not. You know, Jesus is a lot of things, but there's probably just as much stuff that he's not, right? And people get into trouble. We add some things to who Jesus is too often, I think. We can forget about some of the things that he, that he does and think, well, that's the problem. But, but we have just as much of a problem when we add things to him. There's a lot of things that Jesus is not. I want to take a real short historical survey here of some of the more interesting heresies in the church. Some of these heretics you might have heard of, some you may not have, but I will almost guarantee that their false teachings are something that's going to be familiar. Maybe you've heard it in a different name or a different place. Let's take a look first at Arius. He was Bishop of Alexandria, 318 A.D. Yes, this goes that far back. He taught that Jesus Christ was not eternally divine, 
but that he was the very first and the highest creature. Now he took his biblical evidence from places like Colossians 1.15 that says, He, that is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Sounds pretty cut and dry to me. He's the firstborn. That means he was born, right? But what Arius didn't understand was the context that this passage was coming from. And in this context, firstborn is not a statement of chronology. It doesn't mean he's necessarily the first in the order. It doesn't necessarily mean that uh, he was born. It's a statement of status. It's a legal statement. Jesus holds the status of the firstborn. Let me help you uh, see something like this. We've seen a story in the Bible, Jacob and Esau. Y'all remember that story, hopefully. If not, uh, here we go. <laughs> Jacob and Esau. Jacob was not the firstborn son. Esau was born first. He was birthed first. But he sold his birthright, and then his younger brother, Jacob, gained the rights of the firstborn. He gained the inheritance. Jesus is the rightful heir to all creation. So the problem with Arianism, that's this false doctrine, is essentially the same with all the heresies. They're all the same thing. They diminish, or they destroy, they seek to twist the atonement of Jesus Christ. That is, that thing which makes His blood pay for your sins and save you from your sin. There's a theological term for that. It's called monkeying with the atonement. And we don't like to do that, right? We all like to be saved from our sins, amen? All right, so we don't want anything that monkeys with the atonement. Arius decided better. Now, he had, a, he had a buddy named Apollinarius. No relation. Bishop of Laodicea. Now, he thought not to be outdone by Arius. I'm going to one-up him, and I'm going to come up with my own heresy. He probably didn't think it was heresy, but he said that it's not what Arius says, guys. Listen to me. Jesus is part God and part man. He's a hybrid. You know, like those bass that have the stripes on them that don't match up to our fishermen. Those are good bass, by the way. He's a hybrid. And he thought that because humanity was like the Trinity, body, soul, spirit. He said, well, Jesus is like that. Human body, human soul, divine spirit. Only his spirit is divine. Maybe that sounds familiar. This is one of those that has come back in fad recently. Then there's Nestorius, a monk in Antioch around 428. He preached that Jesus of Nazareth was not incarnate, but merely indwelled with the Spirit of God. See the problem here? He says, he's indwelled with the Spirit of God. How do you know that, Nestorius? Because he died. God can't die. You can't kill God. So what you killed on the cross was the human part. The God part escaped the cross. See a problem with our atonement? He's monkeying with our atonement, isn't he? Eutychus was an abbot in Constantinople, 430. He argued that Jesus was not a man uh, who was indwelt... Uh, by God, like Nestorius, but that when the Spirit of God landed on him, he was transformed. He was born 100% God, and at, uh, at the uh, baptism, he transformed into 100% God. So he didn't have two natures, natures simultaneously, but sequentially. First one, then the other. And then there were the Gnostics, finally here. And they taught kind of the opposite. That Jesus wasn't fully man at all. As a matter of fact, he was 0% man, 100% God. He only looked like a man. He, uh, he just had the appearance of a man, like a ghost almost. Like he tricked us all. And, and the reason for that is because they, they saw the flesh as something that's vile and evil. And God would never taint himself with human flesh. People still talk about this sort of thing today. There's a, there's a sentiment that that's the case. We're going to shed off all this old flesh and go to heaven, but, but really we're not shedding off this flesh, flesh permanently, right? We're, we're shedding off an imperfect body to put on a perfect body one day, just as Jesus Christ himself did in his resurrection. So why in the world take all this time to talk about these things today? First, it's just interesting to me and... I'm preaching, so I get to do that. So there, there you go. Uh, but, but really, I want you to be aware because these things come back. They don't really die. They just get resurrected in new bodies. 
and evil bodies and new forms and and you will see them and not just from wackadoodles but from people that you might respect or from a book you might expect to hear something solid you'll hear something kind of like these things and I want you to be aware and I want you to remember that theological term we learned today and not let anybody monkey with your atonement you don't want that but maybe more, more so today to draw a contrast between man-made religions and what God has taught us. Uh, man-made religions make things easy. They make things simple. As a matter of fact, oftentimes they take what God has made ambiguous and try to flatten it out so that it's easy to swallow, it's easy to consume. That's hard to understand. Well, here, says the heretic, let me just make that easy for you. I'll get rid of the questions. I'll get rid of the difficulties. I'll get rid of the confusion. Yeah, we might have to mark out a few scriptures here, twist a few to make it work, but it's going to be easy. It's going to be simple. You know what? This is a difficult doctrine, and I'm glad for it. I'd rather my God be too difficult for me to understand than easy, right? I mean, what kind of God would it be if you were like, oh, yeah, that all makes sense, perfect. I got God figured out, and I don't really, there's no mystery left. I know exactly who he is, how he does everything. It's like looking behind the curtain at a magician. What's the point? You know, we don't want a God who's that easy to understand. But you can see how easy it is to miss the point, right? You can see how easy it is to be tempted to want to go here and to help God out. God, I don't know if you mean, meant to do this, but your word here is a little confusing. I'm going to help you out by explaining it away. I'm going to ex explain away the difficulty for you so that your people can understand it. Well, today we're not going to explain it away. We're just going to explain it. I'm just going to tell you the truth of God's word and call you to believe it. And the first thing is that Jesus of Nazareth was and is 100% divine. He was 100% God and he still is. Christ Jesus, who although he was in the form of God... He was in the form of God. He existed. I want to focus on that phrase, existed in the form of God. Let's take a, a little bit of a deeper look here. That first word existed, it, in the Greek it's actually existing. In your King James it says being. To kind of try to capture some of that. But it's really hard to capture the essence of the meaning of that word in English. So hard. This is what Vincent's word studies says about that. He says this word has a backward look into the antecedent condition which has been protracted into the present. You got that? Everybody clear on that now? It's even hard to say it in English. But what he means is Jesus has always been God. That's what he's saying. He has always existed. He was existing. He does exist as God. It's not as if all of a sudden Jesus became God. Or as if all of a sudden Jesus rose to divinity. He wasn't a creature who was promoted to godhood. We know from other scriptures like John chapter 1 that Jesus was eternal. It says, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God and the Word was with God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He always has been, He is, He always will be God. The next word I want you to look at is morphe. The word form in English. Morphe, you know, that's a familiar word. We know metamorphosis, right? To change form. Polymorphous, having many forms. But the word here is a little deeper than that. It's a little deeper, not quite as simple as just the shape of what something looks like. Uh, consider Plato, the Greek philosopher, he had this idea of perfect forms in heaven. Now, he used the word morphe. He said, you can sit in a chair anywhere on the planet. Beanbag chair, high chair, uh, stadium seat, doesn't matter. Every chair, no matter what it looks like or what its shape is, has chairness, right? It's a reflection of that perfect form in heaven. It makes it a chair because it has chairness. Well, Jesus Christ existed in the form of God. He possessed godness and it is that godness that he laid aside when he became human he didn't cease being god 
But he laid aside the morphe, the form of divinity. Now the big takeaway from the passage is really simple. Jesus is God. Jesus always has been God. He's God right now. He always will be 100% God. He was of the same substance and form of God. Not a secondary creature. And that's important. That's incredibly important. Because without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as God, there would not be enough value in His blood to pay for your sin debt. You and I, we've committed a lot of sins. Think about the sins of the whole world and think about who you've offended. There's an infinite number of infinite offenses. No finite creature could pay that debt. We had to have a divine sacrifice. The blood of goats and bulls, even men or angels, would not suffice. The blood had to be divine. The second, Jesus was also 100% human. Now, the, the God part, I think we get. That's pretty easy for most of us. This is where it gets a little tricky. He's 100% human. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped or seized, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. He did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. The word there really for grasp is more like seize or snatch, take hold of. In other words, Jesus let go voluntarily of what it meant to be divine. The equality with God. He voluntarily gave it up by emptying himself, as the New American Standard says, of his godness. He was still God, but instead of the form of God, he put on the form of a servant. And the likeness of men. He became like you and I. He put off godness and put on humanness. It's easy to think of God or Jesus as divine, right? He's the Son of God. That means He's divine. He, man, look at the miracles that He performed. And John said, if I were to write them all down, you couldn't contain all the stuff that He did in a book. I mean, He walked on water, He fed thousands of people, He raised the dead. Of course He's God. We're called to worship Him. Yes, He's God. That's why it's the humanity of Jesus that so often concerns or confuses us. We don't have a problem with the divine Jesus. We have a problem with the human Jesus. But make no mistake, it is just as important that Jesus is fully man as He is fully God. Think about it. If He merely appeared to be human like the Gnostics say, then his death on the cross was imaginary, and you spilled imaginary blood, and that makes your salvation imaginary salvation. Now, if on the other hand, he was fully God but not fully man, we have no human king on David's throne, we have no seed of Abraham, we have no new Adam as a human being come to undo the curse, we have no real kinsman redeemer if Christ is no part in humanity we need both but friend I, I want to caution you now do not be lured into false teachings that seem to give Christ more honor by taking away his humanity or diminishing his humanity or covering up his humanity or playing down his humanity or excusing away explaining away his humanity they may sound pious, saying things like, Oh, the flesh is too vile for Jesus. The flesh is tainted with sin. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a low thing. It's a humiliating thing for God to clothe Himself in flesh. And folks, that is the point. That's why Paul is writing all this. Let me tell you something really awkward. Get ready to cringe. People have always had a problem with a God who visits the restroom. Feels weird, doesn't it? Why? Because it's too human. It's too common. It's too base, vulgar even. Ugh, I don't want my God to do that. I want my God to sit on thrones. 
The fact that it makes you uncomfortable means that you get it. It's humbling to be one of us. It's shameful. It's lowly for God to stoop to be one of us. That's what he's saying. That's why people don't like it. But we dare not excuse away of the humanity of the son of Mary and Joseph the carpenter. God took on flesh and dwelt among us, being born in the likeness of men with bowels that work like ours. He got sweaty and exhausted, hungry. He probably got the flu like some people here today. Uh, not here today, hopefully, have the flu. We recoil at the thought of the infant Jesus being anything but perfect, right? Silent night, you know, Jesus is not crying. Baloney, he was crying, he was a baby. He wet his diaper. Somebody had to feed him. And as awkward as that sounds, as shameful as that sounds, that is our only hope for salvation. And we cannot diminish Jesus' humanity at all. Our only hope for salvation is that Jesus Christ was one of us. That we have a high priest who can sympathize with our weakness. It's part of the plan. Thirdly, Jesus is our humble Savior. He humbled Himself to become a human being. As we go further, Philippians 2.8 And being found in human form, He humbled Himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. Even, even the death on the cross. As if becoming a living human being was not humbling enough, he volunteers himself to be executed on a Roman cross. I'm not going to tell you something that's wild and crazy, but, but I do want to remind you. Execution by the cross, we call it crucifixion, was a humiliating death. It was not something that was done to Roman citizens, unless they were deserters in the army. It was done to slaves, it was done to foreigners, people of little consequence, people who didn't matter. It was a humiliating death. It was shameful. Jesus was humbled in the incarnation, but on the cross he was humiliated for you and me. In the incarnation, he emptied himself of his divinity. On the cross, he filled himself with your sin and the filth of all humanity. He was humiliated. He was shamed. He was scorned and despised. His own father wouldn't look at him. He couldn't. He was disgusted by what he saw. Why did God do this? Why would He do that? Why did He give up glory and prestige and power and authority? Why did He give all of that up for suffering and weakness and shame? Why did He humble Himself like this? It's a good question. See, for some people, this crucified Jesus is a stumbling block. I can't get past it. I can't get past a God who would do that. My God is a strong God. And then for some people, it's foolishness. It's just silly. You're mistaken. <laughs> An all-powerful being couldn't die. But to those who are called, it is the power and wisdom of God. It does not make sense to an outside world looking in. They are not impressed with our humble God. You know that? The world is not impressed with our humble God. Oh, Jesus was a fine teacher and, you know, he was martyred and all that, but he's not really God. I mean, come on. They're not impressed with him, the God who took on flesh. I am. I'm beyond impressed. I'm 
I'm grateful. I'm in debt to him. I'm filled with gratitude. And as I said last week, if there's something lower than humble, I'm, I'm that. Whatever that is. You know, there's, there's an old poem somewhere that says, you know, we asked Jesus how much he loved me and he stretched out his hands and said this much. Well, that's cute and all, but that's not why he stretched out his hands. He stretched out his hands because you couldn't pay for your sin debt. He didn't do it to show you how much he loved you. No, I mean, he did love you, but he had to do it. He didn't want to just say, here's a good example of love. Let me die for you. He said, you can't pay this penalty. Nobody can. I'm going to do it for you. Let me shift gears here. You've done bad things. Now I'm talking to you. We all have. Now some of the things we've been able to convince ourselves weren't so bad. Well, I'm not really that bad. You know, I, I have some people said that was wrong. But it's not really that wrong. Or I kind of had to do it, this and that. But even with all of your rationalization, deep in your heart, you know there are some things you've done. There are some things you've said. There are some thoughts that you've thought that are evil, wicked. Everyone in this room, everyone watching knows that. We all deserve God's punishment. For those things. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. And did you know you can't erase bad things with good deeds? You can't. That's not how it works. If I get caught murdering somebody, I can't say, well, you know what? I'm just going to make that up by feeding a bunch of homeless people. We'll just cancel out that murder, you know, by all these good things. No. You would never stand for that. And we're mere humans with a flawed judgment. God could never stand for that. He can't erase sin and evil just because you've done something good. You're supposed to do something good. That's the bare minimum. That's expected of you. It doesn't work like that. We need a Savior because we are under the penalty of death. But my friend, somebody's already paid the penalty for you. Somebody's already suffered the wrath of God for your crimes. Now, you can choose to reject this message and go about your way. You can deal with your guilt and your shame the way you always have. You can take your chances when you die. You, you can roll the dice. That I'm wrong. And what? There's nothing or everybody goes to heaven? I don't know. You can roll the dice on that. Just see how it works out. Or, or you can humbly put your faith in Jesus Christ today and admit what you already know to be true, that you are a sinner who's done bad things. Evil things. And those things deserve God's wrath. You can put your faith in Jesus Christ who humbled himself to the point of death on the cross for you. Because you couldn't pay that debt. No one can pay their own sin debt. That's why hell is eternal. You never pay it off. You can trust the one who died in your place, but he didn't stay dead. He defeated death for you. And guess what, folks? One day he's coming back for you as well. He's not just going to leave you here. The Bible says he's preparing a place for you, and he's going to come for you again one day. What are you going to do with that message? In just a moment... I'm going to pray and we're going to sing a song of invitation. And during that song, I'm going to invite you, believer, if you're here today and uh, maybe you've wandered in your heart a field 
you need to renew your faith in this humble Savior, do that today. You can do it in your pew. You can come down forward and pray. Maybe you're here today and you were struck by the gospel and the humble Savior is no longer a stumbling block to you. Today it makes sense. Today you believe. You want to talk with someone about your faith or what it means to put faith in Jesus. I'll be down front here waiting. I'd love to talk with you. If we don't have time to finish the conversation today, we'll make an appointment. We'll finish that conversation. Maybe you're visiting with us today. You'd like to make First Baptist your home church. I'd love to talk with you as well about what that means this morning. Would you come forward as we sing this morning? Let's pray together. Lord God, we are grateful for your word and grateful for this humble servant, the most unlikely of all servants, the Lord God himself. I do pray for your spirit to move in our hearts. Lord, I pray more than anything else that your word has gone forward and it has changed a life today. God, maybe, hopefully, all lives that have heard it today. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.